Praise Jesus. All right, so a few weeks ago, we started looking at this topic, unlocking spiritual benefits. Um, and the reason why we started looking at this topic is because of what is written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. It says, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So, if God has blessed me with everything that I need, how come I'm not seeing it here on earth? How come it's not really visible? How come I'm not obtaining it per time? So that was why we started looking at how do I unlock these spiritual benefits or these things that God, these spiritual blessings that God has blessed us with. I've been at the back of our mind that the spiritual always precedes the physical. Isn't it? So we started looking at ways of unlocking these things. Right? And... We looked at the first one as making pronouncements, speaking to situations. Because James makes us to realize that, what, that the all of our lives and destiny can be defined by what we say. Jesus Christ speaking said to his disciples, And you will say to this mountain, be thou removed, and be cast into the sea, and shall be. So that means the things that we say or we do not say means a lot. Am I right? And I hope really that you started to use your mouth in the positive. Those things that are not going the way you expect, or they are not going the way you want them to go, I hope you have started realigning those things in the path of God. I hope that you have stopped making confessions wrongly because everything you say, remember that you are kings, everything that you say will be established. Scripture says you will say you will decree a thing on earth and it shall be established in heaven. So the things that you say happens. Are you with me, church? Then we move to the next one and we realize that another way that we can unlock the things that God has blessed us with is by sharing in God's divine nature. Because Bible makes us realize that we are partakers of his divine nature. We are not God as God is, but we have some attributes. The day you give your life to Christ, by the Spirit of God, you have some attributes that is similar to the attributes that God has. Right? And we started looking at them. We said one of them is... Sorry, I'm going back. We said one of them is being creative. In the world, being creative is defined as the modification or the addition or subtraction to something that already exists. So if I pick this bottle now, and I decide to change the cap so that the cap is actually on the lower side, we call it creativity, especially when it's accepted, right? So whatever already exists, if you make a modification to it, it's, you're exhibiting creativity. So you can wake up today and say, my tomorrow is not going to be like my today. That means you are creative. Right? If you painted one part of your face today and tomorrow you decide to paint the other side of it, it's creativity. Right? So it's the addition or subtraction or the modification of something that already exists. But we now look at an attribute of God that we refer to as ex nihilo, the ability of God to create out of nothing. So, for example, when God said, let there be light, light was not existing anyway. It wasn't a modification. It was just spoken and it happened. Are you with me? And we realize that it's a nature that God already also puts in you and I. Why? Because that is why you can pray for a woman without a womb, and that woman will have a child. Because with us as of God, we can do things or make things without precedent. It does not have to have existed. Right? It is possible that in your family, nobody has ever gone to school or to university, but you can be the first one. Does that make sense? It is possible for you as a Christian to get jobs that you don't apply for because it is the ex nihilo, the ability of God to create out of nothing that's at work. Do I get an amen? amen. And one way or another, you'd have seen such things manifest in our lives or around us. That even doctors would have written something off and then suddenly result shows up. It is because of that. So number two thing that we looked at as, an, as a nature of God is the holiness of God. The holiness of God. 
It's an ability that anyone who is not in God can never have. The natural man can never be holy. No matter how much you try, you can be a moral being, but you can never be holy. Because we looked at the story that God revealed this principle to us. The first story in the Bible where God revealed holiness to us. We looked at it as when Moses was going to approach God. And God told Moses and said, oh, do not come close, remove your shoe, because where you are standing is holy. It is not because of the life, the life, the land is living. But it's because God is present in that land. So the minute you have given your life to Christ, the presence of God dwells in you. And because of the presence of God that dwells in you, you are separated unto God as holy. Does that make sense? But it is required of you and I to maintain our holiness. I don't know whether, oh, not this kind of tubes. You know, when you, how many of us know what fluorescent tubes are? Fluorescent tubes. Is that what they call it in this country as well? I will tell you the principle about by which fluorescent tube works, right? So what, the way it works is that it draws the hair inside it, keeps removing the hair inside it. The more the hair inside the tube comes out, the brighter it becomes. That's what holiness is. The more you become holy, the more you get God's presence to be inside of you, the brighter your life becomes. Does that mean? So it's an attribute of God. You can use that to unlock a lot of things that's of God. Because the more God is in you, the more nobody can do anything against you. So you want to live a life of victory, ensure that God keeps living in you. And you know that God is holy, will not dwell in an unclean vessel. So when we tell people that, oh, don't live a life of sin, you have to be holy. That's what we mean. Be pure so that God can dwell in you more. The more God is dwelling in you, the more you have victory. The more Psalm 24 can happen. That lift up your head, O ye gates. That's when you can approach things that you've always struggled with and you'll have victory. Am I making sense, Judge? Another thing is we looked at the hypostatic union of God. The ability for two things or two or more things, elements, to come together and function as one. Example, Trinity. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They, are, they function individually, but they are still one. Same and equal. No hierarchy, equal. Three of them in one. It's an attribute of God that God shares with his children so that we can be the best that wants us to be. Are you with me, church? And we looked at that from the position of God calling you and I king, and priests. Because biblically, nobody can be a king and a priest. People always say that, oh, but David was. David was never. He acted as a priest when he went into the temple and took the shoe bread. And it was the mercy of God that kept him from being leprous. So it was not like he was all working in the office of a priest. No, 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 no. He was circumstantial. Right? The mercy of God prevailed concerning him. But you and I, we can reign here on earth, and yet our life please God. It's the apostatic union of God. Right? So God has not called you and I to a life of mediocrity. God has not called you to a vain life, a life of whatever will be, will be. No, God expects you and I to reign here on earth, and yet our life be pleasing to him. Do I get an Amen. I said something fundamental the last time that, hey, if you are not ruling, you are being ruled. Are you with me? Have you not realized that there are people that are married in their own home and that person is ruling them? You might be the manager at work and somebody else in your department is actually the boss. Is that, is that okay? So it's what God has called you and I to be. Amen. But today, we want to move to number three of it. A topic I don't like talking about, but I do not have a choice because as a pastor, whatever it is that you have to say, you have to say it. They, we're talking about this, number three. Oh, I'm the one controlling it. I forgot. <laughs> we want to talk about acceptable giving. Giving that God accepts, giving that can unlock the benefits of God. A few months ago, 
if you remember, in this church, I've never picked up the mic and preached on false fruits. Isn't it? But I remember that somebody came out and gave a testimony on false fruits. Right? That testimony encouraged other people, and before you know it, everybody started giving false fruits. Right? Because if your giving is acceptable and you get the resultant results, you get the resultant effect of what you were expecting in the first place, nobody needs to preach to you to give. Am I right? If the day, let me tell you the truth, why I love to give, right? When I gave my life to Christ, I've shared with several people, one day, I was in my house, I'm talking about a Nigerian story, so I have to use Naira. So I had only five Naira on me, right? And there was this girl that also lives in the same compound as me, the daughter of the landlord, she was going to go do her exam. I have only five Naira. This five Naira will only take me transport to school. No hope of eating or anything. But she wanted to go and write her exam, so I gave her the five Naira that for me. Go and write your exam. And because there was no hope, I decided to walk down to school. I got to the SUB. I sat down there. Since there was no money to eat, it was exam period, I decided to start fasting. <laughs> like some of us would do. I was like, well, if there's no OG, let's just make the best of the situation. So I opened the book in front of me. Exam was like in the afternoon, but the book was not entering because hunger was there. I was staring at the book. And a girl that I've never spoken to before in my life walked up to me and rolled money in her hand like that and gave it to me. I said, this point when she was praying, God said she should give it to me, 200 naira, right? Listen to me. My giving tentacles went up. That if I can give five naira, and the same day I can get two hundred naira, where's the next? <laughs> it was so good that every church that I got to, since that, even up to today, if I come to your church and I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, what can I give to this church? Because I've learned and I've seen. It's just the same way that I always tell people, God forbid I backslide today, I cannot say that Jesus is not Lord. Because my own relationship with God has been experiential rather than what I was told. Are you with me? So the same way in my giving life, it has nothing to do with, oh, whether I was told, whether theology is correct, whether the way they said is correct. No, I have tested and I've seen that the Lord is good. Does that make sense? So if your giving becomes like that, honestly, even the day we forget to take offering, you'll fight us. Because why do you want to deny me? I'm making sense, church. The reason is because all these years, paraventure, we've been giving, and our giving has not been acceptable. You know, it's possible. For example, in the story of um, Ken and Abel, what, both of them brought an offering. This is the first time the concept of offering was going to take place. Both of them brought an offering to God. One was accepted, the other one was not accepted. Are you with me? If it's not important, God will not talk about it. If giving is not important, he's not going to talk about it. There's no need for it to be written in the Bible. Are you with me? When you look at the scriptures still, I just want to quickly browse through areas in the Bible. There's so many areas. It's like reading the old Bible. Right? When God encouraged, spoke, or demonstrated on giving. Are you with me? The story of Abraham, when God called him to sacrifice his only son, that to me is the height of sacrificial giving. Something that you have waited 90 years to get. It's like that job that you have waited forever to get. They now got it, and God now said, give me that one. Some of us will buy the devil. That's the reality of it. Imagine you waited for that job. You waited, waited. Your bills has now piled up. The whole world is laughing on you. Belief is already there, and you are now seated in church. And God now told you, oh, why not give your first fruits? Ah, God, let us plan it. I'll give my first fruits. We spread it over 12 months. <laughs> you know, we start negotiating with God. God, Abraham gave to Melchizedek. You know, when Abraham helped Lot to recover everything. Bible says he gave Melchizedek a tenth of all, right? That's not the focus this morning. God also gave laws through his scriptures, different laws on, on giving. 
just to whether you will accept it by encouragement. If you're not going to accept, accept well, okay, let's put a law in place. So at least whichever we accept, right? More than that as well, God spoke to his prophets. You know that scripture, we'll look at it later. It's a principle that Jesus, God himself demonstrated for us. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave us his only son. He gave us the best that he has because of the love that he has for us. Jesus spoke several about it. The parable of the, tale of, of the good Samaritan comes to light there. Um, Jesus Christ encouraged it through these scriptures. The woman um, with the widow's might. Let me give you, let me, let me paint this because I'd like to paint pictures of scripture. You know, if you're reading your Bible, and I share this in David's class, if you're preaching your, if you're reading your Bible, one of the ways that you can make the Bible so real to you is by putting yourself inside that Bible, inside that scripture. So when you're reading about David, stop reading David as if David is that guy there. You are David. Do you get it? And start feeling what David was feeling. Are you feeling? So look at that scripture. Jesus Christ was in church the same day like this. He was not the pastor. He was like the Kinesiemi. Or Sandra, but when everybody was and you know offering, they come to the front to give you the offering. When everybody was giving the offering, Jesus was doing like that, looking at what they gave you. Look at them, right? Those that were rich, they came out and waved their envelope, praising the Lord because they wrote one million pounds on the envelope and they drop it. Meanwhile, the widow's might, the woman with the widow, the widow would have just praising the Lord, and Jesus Christ looked and acknowledged her own offering over everybody else's. Are you with me? If it was not important, Jesus Christ would not have mentioned it. Are you with me, church? Not just that. The woman with the alabaster box of perfume, right? What happened? Just, the woman came and broke the perfume. And Judas, oh Judas, said, why are we wasting money? How often do you say that? Why are we wasting money in the worship of God? Why are we wasting money in the things of God? Why are we wasting money? Can't we keep that money and give to the poor? That sounds spiritual, isn't it? it, it, it I call it Judaic spirit. Right? It has a form of theology, but it, def, it denies God. When people, and you hear that a lot, oh, ah, the things that we're doing in church, listen, the primary responsibility of the church is to promote the gospel. Primary. I'm not saying we're not going to look after ourselves. We will look. We see it. Is that okay? But think about it. Don't let anybody give you a theology that's not there. Is that okay, church? Now, why is this important? I will browse through it very, very quickly. Number one, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Say, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, look at it, Jesus Christ was a very rich person, but he made himself poor so that you can be rich. Giving is a way of partaking of that grace. The way you enter into that grace of becoming rich, not because of what you do or what you don't do, but because Jesus Christ has already made the sacrifice for you to be rich. The way to partake of that grace is through your giving. I'm going to see how to use it to unlock. Is that Okay. Number two, the law of reciprocity comes there. The law that says God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you will reap. Right? It is the foundation of your reaping. It is the foundation of tomorrow. What you get tomorrow is a function of what you do today. Are you with me? The way you live your life today, the time is what you get tomorrow. Are you with me? The reason why we give is for the welfare of each and every one of us sitting in this place. Listen, what may never happen in this church, that somebody will come to church and leave not knowing what to eat and not having what to eat. God forbid. I thought I would get an amen. amen. It is the worst thing that can happen to us. For example, somebody has an interview tomorrow and they don't even have the clothes to wear to the interview. And we call ourselves a church? We're not a church. Are you with me? We have to look after one another. It's the essence of our giving. The minutes, listen, the way that you look at someone and you think, ah, why is he dressed like that? It's a revelation from God. It's not for you to condemn that person. 
It is because God opened your eyes to see that that person is dressed like that. You have to do something like this about it. You don't do anything about it. It stands against you. Even if you don't have the means, listen, on behalf of that person, go and beg around. It has to be met. That need has to be met. Am I getting an amen? We have people in our midst that are students. And you have not even thought for once, let me even write five pounds check for this person. I think you're a big man. The essence of our giving is to look after one another. In actual fact, tithing, the essence of tithing is so that there will be none of us that is lacking. The reason why we can't use our tithe for welfare currently is because our bills are so much. Because we are not giving enough offering. <laughs> so now we have to empty all the account to pay for bill. I wish the accountant is there and she will tell you. We pay over 9,000 pounds of rent alone. As small as we are. So that is why, see, the essence of our giving is for our mutual existence. We've always trusted God in this church that people will not be out of job for a long time. Let's even assume that you are in between jobs. You should not be at the point that you are begging an unbeliever for your sustenance. God forbid. And you to yourself, you must not to be too proud to ask for help when it's needed. Because you are denying us of the privilege of being blessed if you don't ask us. <laughs> are, you, are you with me? That's why at times when, when it's often time, I say, ask your neighbor. Yeah, I'm not proud. There are times I've asked my wife, am I wrong? I think last week I said, ask you for your card. It's not wrong. It's not wrong. Even if it's one pound, is there one pound in your bag? Collect it, give. That grace is come to you too. Let's not, let's start practicing this Christianity. Another reason why we give is because it's for the keeping and the building of the church of Christ. That's the scripture that I was talking about. People were so focused then about their own properties. I want to get my own property. I want to get to my own property. And God asked to send prophet a guy to chastise them. That how can you be doing this expecting grace to multiply? No, you can't neglect the house of God. You can't neglect everybody that is having issues. Do you know the reason why some people are not in church this morning? Might actually be because they don't have how to get to church. And you drive your car to church. You don't want anybody to stay in it. There are also people in church, they are also users. They will have, but they will rather collect yours. That one is another level. <laughs> that one is, you want to know what level it is? It's wickedness. It's witchcraft, thank you. Because you're manipulating people. May that spirit be bound in this place. In the name of Jesus. You want to be better than everybody else. The, that was what Ananas and Sapphira did. And they lost it for it. It will not be us. Put my scripture back. It is good kingdom investing. I was sharing in Greenwich. Think about it. Every time we have FOL there in Excel, it costs our CCG 500,000 pounds every night. One day. FOL. So when you come for FOL, or if you don't show up, you have denied the payment of that for 100,000 pounds every night. But guess who has FOL? Uh, who has um, Excel? The Qatari group, people of other religion. Is it making sense? See, the only reason, or the, one of the ways of propagating the gospel, whatever gospel it is, is money. I appreciate the fact that a lot of people have used this same money for their own propagation. But that's not what we're talking about today. We won't say because of what they did, we should not do wrong. We should do wrong. I, I used to be in church. But money determines everything. Money determines everything. Somebody, why are we paying 9,000 pounds? Because we feel that this area is where God has called us. Do you know the headache I get towards the end of the month? Towards the end of the month. Do you know why? Because at times I think about it that, ah, should we just leave this place? But if we leave this place, right? We're not here because of the pledge or because of the name. Kind of it doesn't bother me one bit. What's important is people should come inside. But this is where God has called us to. Are you with me? What we pay for just the 
the office. Some churches pay for that for a whole building. At least I know one church like that. It's the same London. So it's investing in the kingdom. It, it makes it makes the gospel the gospel it makes for the expansion of the gospel. Now, the question is, who do you give to? This is the focus of the message. Who do you give to? You know, we're talking about what unlocking the blessings of God. Every time you are giving, you must have the end in mind. What you want to achieve, you must have it in mind. Because if you give to me, the result is going to be different from if you give to Janet. While all of us deserve, or there's a place for all of us to be gifted, right? The result is always different. What you unlock is different biblically. Number one, God. You must always give to God, and it must be the reason of your giving. Do I get an amen? amen? The reason is because when you give to God, that scripture says, God will bless you in all your work. It's an overall blessing. Every time you give to God, every time the re- in fact, there's a church. I won't mention anymore the church because all of us know the church. But there's a lady in that church who, ah, the way that lady lives her life to the natural mind is so foolish and so gullible. Are you with me? But God keeps pouring grace upon her. At times we do all these things gullibly. But as long as the reason why you are doing it is God, God will always be glorified. Are you with me, church? God will always forget about what man do. If a man steals your money, that man is accountable to God. Hmm? You don't worry about that. Do whatever you have to do to the glory of God. And when you do that, when you want God's blessing upon all you do, what do you do? Give to God. Is that okay? Number two, when you honor your father and your mother, you unlock a blessing over your life. Right? Because scripture says, when you bless them or when you give to them, you're making it also long with you in the day. So we're talking about giving today. So let's assume that you give your parents stipend every month. It becomes long with you in whatever way that you are earning your money. The reason why some people lose their job anyhow is because they don't contribute to their parents. In fact, some of us pay bills rather than contribute to them. So you're living with mommy and daddy at home, so you're paying for the room that you're staying in, or you're paying for the electricity that you're staying in. That is not giving. He does not have grace. Am I make, oh, now you can. <laughs> Do you want me to lie? It's the reality. You are not paying bill. bill. The bill does not add grace. It is your giving, free giving. Right? You are paid your bill for your room or for whatever it is that you are contributing. You are paid that one. Then you look at mommy every month. I say, Mommy, this is under pounds for your stipend. Hey, grace is multiplied to you. It becomes long for you. I always encourage people your first salary, at the least, your parents, your mommy, not the two of them. Mommy must get 10%, daddy must get 10%. It doesn't matter whether they live together or not. There's no condition to it. Honor your father and your mother. Not the one that is good, not the one that is bad, not the one that is divorced. Honor your father and your mother. It didn't say honor your father or your mother. It's honor your father and your mother. Do I get an amen? amen. Mm-hmm. I said it all. Mm-hmm. Number three thing. Honor leaders, teachers, your mentors. Look at what that scripture says. Let him that is taught in the world share with him that teacheth. When they teach you believers class, get something, give to your teacher at the end. When they teach you Sunday school, once in a while, recognize the people that teaches you. When your, uh, your, your HODs, one day, recognize them. Last week was pastor's um, appreciation week. Not even one thank you to the pastors. Mm. <laughs> Guess why? Because when you do that, the grace that is in what they have just taught you is multiplied back to you. Do I get an amen? So they've taught you this morning. What's the topic this morning in Sunday school? Hearing from God. 
Then suddenly, you looked at, who thought, Brahma? You thought, you know, Brahma, Brahma, because we are blessing today. Take this 100 pounds, right? Guess what? Brahma does not need to pay, right? What should naturally happen is that the grace that is in that topic is multiplied back onto you. Are you with me, church? There are people in this church, are you with me, that every time we have guest minister, every time, the minute the guest minister is leaving, guess what they do? They follow. Even if it's a um, mobile phone today, they give to the guest minister. Check. They give to the guest minister every time. And guess what? Before, because of where I stand, I see how God multiplied them. Listen, they don't even have good jobs as most of us. But the things that God helps them to do in life, you'll be shocked in this same church. Because they understand whether they were thoughts, whether it is divine, they understand the principle behind it. But you should not just be guest minister. <laughs> Your ministers in church, look after them too. Are you with me, church? Do that. Let the grace be multiplied back to us. In fact, the text that we're meant to read in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1 to 15, Paul was making boast of the Corinthians church. That my God, you guys give like anything. And listen, I've made boast of you all around the world. But just in case, maybe it was a one-off when you gave to me the last time. I'm sending this fellow servant to you so that they can come and tell you ahead that when you give, God multiplies back to you. That was, go and read it very well. Another set that you give to is that you give to everyone that's in need. Do I get it again? Who? Everyone that's in need. Can I hear it? Uh, uh, say it loud. Everyone that's in need. But there's a caveat to it. You give to the those in the house of faith first. The people in your church first who are in need are your first priority. Because the Bible says so. Not me. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 to 10. And let us not be weary in well doing. Because we will reap if we do not faint. Verse 9, verse 10. As we therefore have the opportunity, let us do good unto all men. Emphasis on especially those of the household of faith. If there's somebody in church that needs a pen, some, there's somebody at work that needs a pen, obligation is upon you to sort out that person in church first. Don't invert the orders of God. Because scripture says, whosoever lends unto, whosoever gives unto the poor, lends unto the God. In fact, I don't know, there are some scriptures that I have to leave out because of presentation's sake. Every time we are doing that, you know, Jesus Christ told us that we should lay treasures in heaven where moth and caterpillar do not corrupt. The only way you lay treasures in heaven is by giving to the poor, to those in need. So every time God helps you, in fact, when you look at that scripture that we meant to read today, the last bit says it's an indescribable gift. The giving is a gift from God. Do you know why? There's somebody that is richer than you. There's somebody that, the same person that's richer than you, guess what? Us naturally just likes to give to people. But when it comes to the giving to God and the things of God, they struggle because you don't have that grace. So every time God opens your eyes to see someone who is in need, it is your responsibility it's because God wants to bless you. There are times that you look at someone, you see that ah, the shoe is gone like that. Guess what? Wow, God is about to bless you. If only you understand that, hey, you have to do something about it. Amen. Does that make sense? Then you can give to everybody else. Everybody else. You can give to everybody else. It is a gift. You give to everybody else. So here are some types of giving or giving to God. You know, the first one I said was that giving to God. So let's just look at that today. Number one, seed. Very crucial. Very, very crucial. A lot of us will get it wrong. When you sow in a seed, a seed is a minute, is a small measure or small description of the fruit that you're expecting. Are you with me? You cannot sow water eh? and expect to get mobile phones. Hmm? 
You sow whatever it is that you're expecting. If you want honor, you better start honoring people. If you want respect, you better start sowing respect. If you want monetary increase, you better start sowing monetary increase. Whatever it is that you sow, you will reap. It's a fundamental law of reciprocity. It has nothing to do with whether you are a Christian or not. Hmm? Some of us said, honestly, if you do your birthday tomorrow, nobody will show up. Because you don't show up at any other person's. It's what you've sown. <laughs> Are you with me, church? Whatever it is that you sow is what you get. It's a simple law. The unfortunate thing about it is that whatever it is that you are sowing or you are not sowing, it multiplies itself. Some of us, when we do your birthdays, all you get is cards all true. Because that's all you give. Right? So you sow one card or your birthday gets 20 cards. Praise God. <laughs> I'm not saying it is bad, but say. <laughs> <laughs> don't some of us texts are expensive oh we say on the group oh it's so so birthday you don't even have time to respond to your birthday let us wait for your own birthday the woman will remember it's a principle are you with me church so unto people so unto God whatever it is that you are expecting you must have the mindset of what you are getting in return that is why it's a seed it's an investment. Are you with me? So you are coming to church. Thank God for the offering envelopes that you have. You're coming to church. You know that you are trusting God. God, ah, I have this need that is coming. Okay, I'm going to sow this five pounds. Because your word says, with the same measure, I'm going to get whether 20, 50, or 100. That's always the measure. All right, so I'm expecting to sow. I sow this exactly. I always tell people, whether the devil likes it or not, when my son is a teenager, he can never, never need help as a teenager and he will not get. Do you know why? Every time I was in the youth church, it was my own seed for the life of my own son. I did not expect a young person to say thank you to me. Because I know that no matter what, if that boy needs somebody to, if it's his baby, somebody will be somewhere to just knock his head up. <laughs> yeah, because I did it to some people. <laughs> it's the truth. Am I wrong? Do you know that I slapped some faces? I slapped. So if my son is misbehaving and somebody slap his face, I say, yeah, I'm ripping. <laughs> it's the truth. It's the truth. So it was my own seed because I expect that as well. If you want to be served, you better serve. Have you not realized that, hey, the way you do some people's job is exactly the same way people are going to do your business when you start? It's the truth. You think that you are dodging against your employer now? Wait till that time. I might make you say church, even if you say I'm not. <laughs> Offerings on the other side is very interesting. It has to be what you want. It is how much you value the things that God is doing for you. That's why that scripture makes us to realize that you honor God. It's an honor to God. So every time we're giving, or when we say offering time, church, don't just say, oh, offering time is a religion. Offering time, and God, okay, let us just give. No, 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 no. Let it be a time that, oh God, I want to honor you. I want to thank you for the things that you've done for me throughout this week. You're honoring him. It's your choice. You put the value on it yourself. Don't see it as another routine. It's not a routine exercise. In fact, we're praying to God that one day we'll get to the point of not needing to take offering. That you will naturally just know that, ah, God, thank you. As I'm going home now, I need to drop my offering. You put your offering there. Nobody needs to cajole you. We don't need to quote scriptures for you because you know that ah, I want to honor God. And there are so many types of offering. Not today. We'll talk about that next time. Is that okay? But when you're giving your offering, God feels honored within himself. Another one which is very important. You know, we said seed. Whatever it is that you sow, you're going to get. Am I right? Vow is the other side of that. You make a vow in this way to get something else. So I can say, God, I'm going to give all the water that is in this church from now on, right? Because I expect that every month you're going to bless me with this. 
Jesus Conference Committee, I use this every day, came to you and said, ah, and you vowed I'll give you five pounds, and you chose not to do it, don't worry. No, 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 it is a vow. Don't just give it. Do you know this, do you know this is why we don't pay it? Do you know this is why we don't pay it? Because we don't understand that it's a vow. You don't understand that. Don't just give your money unnecessarily like that. It's a waste of time. It's not a donation. Don't donate. Don't donate in church. It's a waste of your money. Right? Tie something to your offering. That God, as I'm going to make this commitment for Jesus' conference, for every prayer that they make during Jesus' conference, I receive it. Do you understand where I'm coming from? Apply wisdom to things. The people in treasury, I had a meeting with the HOD, or with the head some time back, and I said, don't you guys get it? You are counting people's money. You, people have to count your own money. It is a vow that you sow in with God. So that's why when everybody's gone home, guess what you do? You do it gladly because you know the more this offering is becoming more, the more it's going to take people time to count my own money too. Learn wisdom. Let me give you an example. When we started church, could you bear me witness to this? The first person that drummed for us in church, Ronke's brother, what was his vow? Do you remember? He wanted to work in Kenner Wolf. We did not invite him to this church. He was still in university at that time. And guess what? He wanted to work in He said every time he drums, that's the only prayers. Listen, every time we pray, whether you like it or not, God is hearing that drum. That's how to do it. Don't just come and serve for nothing. That's why at times you serve and it becomes a work. It's not a work. It's meant to be a seed. It's meant to be a vow for the future. Am I making sense? Give yourself to God. However, Ecclesiastes number 5, verse 4, says, when you vow a vow, do not delay in paying it. Because God is, has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. <laughs> I didn't write that. That's the Bible. The Bible is interesting. <laughs> If I want to read that scripture further from verse 1, a vow you'll be like, God, this vow thing. <laughs> and number 5 is tight thing, which we all know, isn't it? Which has been bastardized so much so in the social media lately. And I do not intend to add to the debate, but to teach us this morning. Look at what that scripture says. Every tight, whether of sea, of land, or of fruit, is the Lord. It is holy unto God. You know, when we're talking about the holiness of God, we say it's a result of God being part of something. Isn't it? So that land, because God was there, it became holy. Right? What that scripture is saying is that every time you tight, that means God becomes part of your money. So when God is now saying that it will rebuke devourers for your sake. It's because every time you've tightened, guess what? God is now part of your finances. Which devourer will show up? Am I making sense? Because your money has now become holy. That is why you are wasting your tithes. If you are paying tithes and you now take part of the same money and give to girlfriends. Oh. Am I? <laughs> it's not somebody that you're not going to marry. That's what I mean by girlfriend. I'm not talking about the one that you're getting married, you're planning to get married to. Or you now take part of the money and you now use for something wrong. Does that mean it's because what is already holy is holy? You cannot, you cannot cast pearls onto swines. You've paid sight, God is now within your money, your finances. You now decide to use that same money to be going to clubbing or to go to drink alcohol or to... God is not... Hey, it's down to you. Precious. So how can I ensure that my giving is acceptable? Please pay attention to this. Because if not, you can as well be making donations every Sunday. I just will glorify. Number one. Oh. You have... To give with the right reason and the right motive. Never give money because you want to impress somebody. Are you with me? Never give money because you want to impress someone. I was sharing in church in Greenwich. There are times that, oh, the day that you want to give your fattest offering, 
That's the day that God has blessed you. That's the day you now remember to fill all the envelope. Right? And you now write the figure up big. Every time when you want to give your offering, you fold your offering, offering like that. But on that day, you now remember praising, oh God, I just worship you. I just exalt you. Listen, the day you do that, you've already gotten the result of that immediately. That's what the Bible says. So please, give with the right motive. Nobody looks at your offering in this church. I don't even know who gives the fattest. Because for me, it doesn't matter. I don't even know what you give. Right? Yeah, I know. I check the tithes of my ministers once in a while. Because if they are the ones leading us and they are not doing it, I don't want them to bring a curse upon us. Isn't it? So, and also, not just because of that, because also I care. Because if you are not paying your fight, there might be a reason why you are not paying your fight. Maybe you even have to work and I don't know. Maybe you have bills that you are meant to pay that I don't know. So when I'm checking your fight as a minister, is because I care about you. Does that make sense? The rest of you, I, don't, I care, but... <laughs> <laughs> But, no, what I mean is that I don't bother about what you pay. Is that okay? Because I don't want to see you and not be able to correct you. Because, of, ah, my God, Joker is the one that pays the most in this church. So when Joker is now being naughty, ah, I don't worry, it's fine. <laughs> no, 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 I'd rather slap your face straight away. So that you know that. <laughs> Are you with me? That's why I don't check it. Is that because I do, I'm just man in the flesh? I don't want my judgment to be miscued, so I will not check it. So don't try to impress me. Right? Let it be between you and God. What you do, give with the right motive. Give with the right intention. Give because of what you want to do. When they're calling, oh, how many people want to do Jesus conference? Don't raise up your hand because everybody's thinking that, ah, it was only you that did not raise up your hand. No, 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 no. You don't have to. But when you do, God honors you. Number two, for your giving to be acceptable, this is very crucial, it must be done sacrificially. That was the reason why one gift was accepted in the beginning and one was not accepted. That is the reason why when God was not calling Abraham, he said, thy son, your only son, give it. Because giving that's of God has to be done sacrificially. When God was going to give us Jesus, that was the only thing he asked. He gave us his best. So, the giving that's acceptable, you see, that's what Jesus Christ also demonstrated by the widow's might. Somebody might give one million pounds and you might have given the least. How sacrificial is what you are giving? I was, I shared with a few people that are not in relationship yet and those of you in relationship also listen. Don't be carnal, Right? But how sacrificial is the person that wants to marry you? That's the question. Because they buy you new cars every week does not make them sacrificial. I hope you know that. Because if the guy can afford to buy you airplane every week and is buying you cars every week, it's not being sacrificial, it's doing out of convenience. But when the man will say, don't worry, you take this five pounds and go on the train, have a walk, that is sacrifice. That's the person you marry. It is not about what is given. It's about the sacrifice behind it. Do things that are not comfortable for you for God and let God stand up on your behalf. Do that, that, that make sense? That's why David said, I will not give God anything that does not cost me. Someone was going to give David what to sacrifice. He said, no, 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 no. no. I, I have to give the one that's going to cost me. Give without being hypocritical with your giving. Like I said, let, your Lord, let not your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Sweet, sorry. <laughs> when Abraham, when God told Abraham, sacrifice your only son, he was not hypocritical about it. Even the wife did not know. Because let's assume that God did not even stop and they sacrificed. <laughs> when Abraham comes, what will happen? <laughs> Even, forget that, this is why I was saying that when you're reading the Bible, put yourself in it, right? So forget, forget even that. Okay, let's assume, look at how the story would now have been. Abraham now came home and said, ah, you know what, I'm just coming from the mountain. I'll just go and kill Isaac. <laughs> what do you think the woman would have done? That's the end of trust. 
all the bank accounts, everything. Every time they are going out, right? Where are you going? <laughs> Don't be hypocritical about your giving. Part one. Give consciously. Don't let anybody bamboozle you to give. Be certain, be convinced in your heart what you want to give. When you're coming to church, be certain of what you want to give, why you want to give it, what you're expecting in return. Do I get an amen? Does that mean that God cannot lead us? God can lead you. Somebody can be preaching, somebody can be talking, as I'm talking now, and God might be leading you to do something. That is fine. But don't be cajoled into giving. Don't do impulsive giving, emotional giving. It doesn't get results. Myself and my wife, we laugh at ourselves. I was back in the days, there was somebody that came, amazing. You know, the man, one of the richest people in the world. So they said different things. And no money, we had to delve into credit card. We paid it through our nose. <laughs> Be sure that you're giving thanks to the things that you have thought this morning. Don't just give for the sake of, oh, praise God, I'm the richest person in this world. If you're giving, oh, give so that you can have my grace. Who we'll say, where's does everything without what you have been thought this morning? Don't give foolishly. Give consciously. Look at the, I hope I wrote those scriptures. Each one must give as, is, as he has decided in his heart. It's your decision what to give. Nobody's decision. Not reluctantly or under compulsion because you have to give cheerfully. Every time you give grudgingly, you have wasted your money. Right? It doesn't mean that I can't encourage you. If you're my daughter, like Marilyn, I've told you, go and buy me so, 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 so. Because Jacob did the same thing. Uh, sorry, Isaac did the same thing. Is it Jacob? Isaac did the same thing? No. Abraham, Ab Isaac. Yeah, I told Esau, go and make me venison so I can bless you. It's okay because we have that relationship. Does, does that make sense? Because I have that relationship. But I don't have that relationship with you. I just come to you and say, um, you know, okay, so there's somebody. Let me use the example. So somebody was traveling and I said, oh, can you let me buy so, 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 and so, where you went to? Think about it. As pastor, every time you are traveling, I can tell you, let me buy so, 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 and so. Because when you come back, you're not going to ask me for the money, don't you know? <laughs> but when this person was not going to, no, this person said, no, no. I said, no, you must take this money compulsorily. Because it was not your choice in the first place. If you buy me something willingly, it is different from me using reverse psychology on you. <laughs> Are you with me, George? Don't let anybody. It doesn't get results. Then lastly, look at that scripture. It says, on the first day of every week, each one of you should put something aside, stored up. So your offering, you should have consciously stored them up. Make plan for it. And God bless us. Now the final thing, this is the most crucial part of it. Listen, church. See, this last slide is very crucial. Every of your giving must hinge on this ultimate motivation. Love. Right? The reason why you give must fulfill the commandment of God. They asked Jesus Christ, which one is the greatest commandment? He said, number one is what? Love the Lord your God. Number two is what? So you must give because you love God or you give it because you love your neighbor. Anything else, forget it. It's not going to stand. It's not unlocking anything. Have I spoken well this morning? The scripture that we said that we didn't read, the first bit, says that giving is a gift of God. Go ahead this morning, bow your head to God and talk to God that God, give me this gift. Okay. Give me, give me that grace, that grace this morning to be able to give unto you. Talk to God quickly.